Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, discussion as part of the Recovery Connect uh, grant that we've received. Um, in this session, it's a result of a question that we received from a participant who said, oh gosh, we got a grant and we have grant partners. We need to build a coalition. How do we keep the momentum up? What do we do to make sure all of the partners stay engaged? So I've invited my colleague, Paula Downs, uh, and I'm gonna let Paula introduce herself here in a minute uh, to join this conversation. And it's going to be very informal. We have some discussion questions that I'll share with you in a minute, but feel free to jump into the conversation uh, whenever you'd like or uh, text us a question. Um, so Paula, I'm gonna uh, share my screen here with everyone and um, let you introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm, I'm Paula Downs. I uh, found myself in a role, a big, very big role where I received a grant and had to think through some of these um, discussion questions and these processes. And I have a lot of lessons learned. So part of why I uh, engage with Lisa is just to share that knowledge and then maybe learn some things from you all too. But more importantly, just give you some of those lessons learned and some of the things that might help you um, prevent uh, doing something that might not be as beneficial to you or the granters. So I'm, I'm appreciative of the invitation. So thank you, Paula, for helping. Uh, can everyone see a screen that says discussion questions on it? No, I have not shared it right then. Um, did that work? Looks great. Okay, yes. good. Thank you. So we're going to kind of walk through these and Paula and I are, are going to offer some suggestions for each of these topics, but uh, for anyone else that's online that would like to contribute again, we're very happy to have this be an open dialogue. So the first thing I thought about is when I would receive a grant and I knew I had partners in the grant. How do I notify or organize those partners and and one of the things that, that I have done is first, you wanna make sure that you have memorandums of understanding or letter, a letter supporting it when you submit with your grant. So those are the most likely partners you'll have. But as you go along in the work, you may find that you add new partners. So I think it's really important to have a kickoff meeting with your partners, uh, make sure everybody um, has a copy of the grant parts that are relevant to them. Um, you will get something called grant assurances when you get a grant and it requires lots and lots of signatures from the organization that's being awarded the grant. Um, so you wanna be sure that all of your partners understand what those assurances are and that you have a responsibility to meet those assurances. So the kickoff meeting is really important and it's also important to identify who in your partner organization is your contact person? So are you supposed to contact the executive director uh, or is there a staff person that it's more logical for you to work with uh, for the grant work? Um, Paula, you wanna talk a little bit about timelines and organization? Sure. I think what I found to be really, really helpful is for them to understand what they've gotten themselves into. So I always say they really need to understand um, the not only the work that they uh, decided to partner with you around, but also what does that really look like for them? So if it's a really long planning process or a really long project, then it's it's important to, uh, for them to understand, I'm going to need you once a month for the next 12 months, or I'm going to need you once, a, you know, twice a month. So if they can understand their real commitment, and sometimes if there's been a distance in between the time that you applied for the grant and you actually got the grant, you want to check in and make sure that they still are able to provide the services in the way that they thought they would be able to and over the period of time, because they may have uh, said, yeah, six months ago, this sounded really great, but we lost the person we were going to assign to work with you all. So I think that orientation and timeline really helps them set the stage for what is the commitment who is committed and for how much of their time and what do we really need at that point? Um, because 
they may have had a change in their own circumstance and they, we need to think about things differently from the very beginning. I'm really um, not very uh, good with Zoom, you all. So I'm not being able to see the text messages. So Isabel, if any text questions come through, would you let us know? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll read them out if they do. Let me, okay. Okay. yeah, I think you're good so far though. Great. So um, the next piece that or question that came to my mind was how do we keep those partners engaged once once we've got everybody together, we've had an orientation, we've kind of developed a timeline about what we think their responsibilities are. Um, then I think you have to be real strategic about how you use their time. So you don't want to have lots of meetings that are not relevant to their part of the grant or uh, say everybody needs to get together um, even if there's not work to be done or topics to be discussed. So you want to be really careful of how you use their time and that you're considerate of the time and let them know that you're going to be considerate of the time. So when you do call a meeting, they understand they really need to participate or show up. Um, so you want to make it um, as simple and easy for them to do their part of the grant as possible. Um, and kind of Paul and I had talked earlier about wanting to engage people early in the process. Um, and Paul, you want to talk a little bit more about the advantages of that? Uh, yeah, I think I think what it, what it helps is for them to understand. I mean, we talked about them understanding commitment, but it's also about how to deliver what they said they were going to deliver. And sometimes um, you might go in and say, "We're going to provide training," okay? But how you provide that training may not have been specified. And so how do you brainstorm with them to get them on board and excited about offering their portion? And if it's a, if they're volunteering hours to, to help work on something, or if they're saying, you know, we're just going to give you money and we're just going to let you use that, then, and then it looks different. So I think that you have to define what's the role of that partner or that, um, and, and how are they engaging? And then specifically, can you talk to them about how to do actually engage, right? So from a training perspective, I'll just go back to that. If you're supposed to train so many in the community, how do we do that? And maybe they can be part of designing that. So if they're bought in early and not just being told, um, I think that's helpful. And it depends on engage. We talked a lot about I had to engage people for three years. Well, it's great when you have the big kickoff and you meet with them, but about six months in, they're like, oh my gosh, what did I get signed up for? This is taking way too long. So I think that if we can show the little wins, if we can show progress, if we can deliver progress reports to them, if we can say, you know, maybe we're going to meet on Zoom for a half an hour and not meet, or maybe we're going to meet, but maybe you only need to be at every other meeting, or maybe you need to be at this meeting and then I'll just check in with you. So I think meeting them where they are and where they can be engaged effectively is good, but expecting somebody to come to a monthly meeting over three years, that could be a real hardship and, and they are going to lose their energy. And I think getting the right people in the room is helpful too. I know that sometimes we build partnerships with maybe a CEO or a director, but are there some people within their organizations that might want that experience, have that expertise, might be better suited uh, to commit time? And so I, I, always I always try to look at that as what are the services that they said that they would help us deliver or how are they engaged? But more importantly, can we get buy-in early on in a way that makes sense to them because they've got a perspective? So however we can entice them into staying and however we can engage with them in a way that makes them excited to participate. I think that's really critical. That's a good point. And also remember that when you write the grant, it may be a year to 18 months before you actually get the money and have to launch the program. And in that period of time, your players may have changed. So uh, I've run into situations where um, the CEO agreed to something, left, a new CEO came, and the new CEO 
has to be persuaded that this is a good thing and that they need to be involved and there's some benefit to their organization. So I think the follow-up uh, information you mentioned, Paula, of pushing out the little successes is critical to keeping that sustained buy-in. And, and I've done things like planned kickoff meetings and had two of the seven partners show up. So that, that initial launch time of getting everybody on board sometimes takes a little longer than you think it should because you've got to build these strong communication systems and identify who the people are that are going to be truly a part of the process. Um, and that, that takes a little time. And I think that I think sharing with them uh, and sometimes they come into this and they only know what their role is. So sharing with them the bigger picture, I think is helpful. Uh, I, I think they want to understand how do I fit into this puzzle. And so uh, being able to share what I call the overall or the overarching purpose and the goals, but also the other partners, like who else is involved has power, who else is involved and in what ways has power, and, and it kind of keeps them engaged. And if there's been a huge time lapse in between the award and uh, the application and the award, it's even more critical to remind them about what the purpose is because in that year or year and a half or six months a lot has changed and they've done a lot of different work so if you have sort of that what i call the elevator speech about what the broad perspective is and then who the partners are but how they're each going to contribute that sometimes helps keep people engaged and and might convince that new ceo oh i really do want to be a part of this yeah good points um the next question we thought we'd visit about is how to monitor partners and keep them on track. So as Paula said, you can have a grant that runs for three years or five years. And how do you make sure that everyone is completing what their role or responsibility is uh, and staying on task? So once in a while, it takes a little personal encouragement uh, or a little nudge where you get a hold of the people involved by phone or even you travel to visit those people and try to set up a, a meeting, a lunch meeting or something to uh, explore what the challenges they are facing in terms of being compliant with the grant. Um, you will probably have to remind people over the course of the grant period what they've committed to and what their time deadlines are um, because they might not necessarily remember it. Um, and we mentioned this earlier, Paula did about identifying uh, one of their staff people if the CEO doesn't have time to invest in this or that someone else has the expertise needed for this part of the grant, um, encouraging them to, um, to uh, assign or tell us who they would like us to work with so that we can uh, keep the work moving forward. <clears throat> You also may face situations where partners just leave, and that's hard. Um, they just decide they don't want to do this anymore. Or they can't comply for whatever reason. And if they are a, a partner who's providing some of your match dollars uh, for your grant, that can be really uh, scary. So you have to have sort of a plan B that if someone leaves, who's going to fill that gap? And, and can you talk to the other partners who might have ideas? that some of the other partners take on some of the additional work because you have to meet that match at the end of your grant period. And so if you lose a partner and they are contributing some things to the match, such as volunteer time or staff time or meeting space, then you have to make that up in some way. So um, monitoring partners is, is a real important aspect of grant administration. Holly, you want to talk about yeah, I, I I lost several key partners um, when it when we got to the award uh, piece, and uh, what I got really good at having to do was um, figure out other partners or influencers who could help me engage with unusual suspects. Right, um, I couldn't. I had already I identified some key partners, but what I really needed is who else. At this point, I had asked everybody in my arena of influence, right, and in my network, and I had to leverage other partners and say, 
if I were to need a thousand dollar in funds or matching, who could help me do that? And would you help have those conversations with me? Right. Do you have people that, you know, so I think it's okay to leverage your key partners who can either uh, exhibit or exert influence and, or leadership to help you get those partner matches done. Um, I also think that sometimes partners um, find themselves really busy Right. And so if they've matched something or if they decided to offer volunteer hours and all of a sudden their workload has gone up, they're less inclined. So we have to figure out um, how do we set incremental goals or work with them around their own timeline? Like I know that maybe in the next two months you can't do this work, but could you do this work? And then in two or three months, do this work and, and realign. So I felt that for me, I was realigning deadlines and goals um, to help keep the partners, but the partners who absolutely could not do the work, then I had to leverage other partners or other network people to say, can we find somebody to fill those gaps? Um, and some of the existing partners stepped up and said, we can we can do more. We, we're happy to do more. So I think if you can set incremental goals and meet them where they are and understand what their timelines are, but also show why they were a partner in the first place, right? Because I think sometimes they thought I was just pulling names out of a hat. Like I'm calling all these people just because. And, and what I really had to think about was why you and remind them why them, because they were so important to the work or one aspect of the work. And so that I think that reminding them, like, you're the expert in this field. I'm not sure who else to get. And I asked them, if you're not going to participate, who else could participate? Um, and, and then they realize, oh my gosh, right? We bring something to this that nobody else does. And I think that showing the importance of their work and the work overall and how they plug into this is critical. And then how do we make sure that we meet them where they are um, so we don't lose them? Yeah. And, and just a reminder, if you do have a partner that drops out completely and you have to find another uh, partner to join, you want to run all this by your program manager. They are there to be helpful. They want you to get this money. They want your project to be successful, uh, but they also want to be informed because it's their money. So they'll, they will probably be just fine with you making substitutions uh, and they recognize that you know, situations change over the course of time, but keep them informed. Don't, don't start juggling things around without uh, letting your program officer know. Mm -hmm. um, just, use that person as someone who's also a resource to help you with challenges on the grant. And, you know, Lisa, I want to add to it. I, I was really fortunate in the sense that we also over partnered so that if we had somebody drop, we could still deliver the service or we could still meet the matching right in, within that. And so sometimes losing a couple of partners will not completely put you out of compliance with the grant. And, um, and I thought, I thought that was kind of lucky in the sense that we did have some that, but we had that, I think they had a minimum, right. That you had to partner with 15 entities and we ended up partnering with 25. And so it, I lost a couple from the very beginning and that was okay. Cause I called the program manager and she says, well, you're still meeting the, you know, what's required. And so sometimes, um, having that plan B from the very beginning is, oh, I might lose, right? And what am I going to do? So um, that helped me too. That's a good point. This next question kind of overlaps into that. Uh, what do you do when a partner is not engaged or drops the ball? And many of the things we've talked about already apply. Um, but I do think within your um, group of partners, identifying those folks who are leaders or have good relationships that can help. Uh, if you do have a partner that is either not doing good quality work or um, just completely vanishes on you, um, look to your, the rest of your partners as a resource. And going back and hitting on that, keeping the momentum up piece that we talked about a little earlier in terms of sending your partners out information about the progress of the grant, um, and keeping them updated so that they see that they're a part of a bigger group and that when they drop the ball, it impacts everybody else's work. 
also uh, trying to uh, clarify for them how important they are and that uh, they are part of this bigger piece. Um, and, and sometimes, Paula mentioned they need to see successes and sometimes they just, just need an encouragement or they may be in a position that they thought they knew what they were supposed to do, but they didn't and they're doing the wrong thing. And so we want to uh, you know, make sure that we have close connections with them to follow up and check up with them. Do you want to add anything to that, Paula? I don't think so. I, I think I think you you hit it overall. It's just meeting them where they are. And sometimes um, you can be successful in renegotiating what they can uh -huh. do at that moment yeah. um, and, and talking to them about, I, I realized you've lost five staff members. And when we first did this, you said you were going to have somebody. Can Is there something that they can do? Can you fit into this puzzle? So I think renegotiating with the help, of course, your program manager approval, but um, they're pretty flexible, and I find that when we respond to grants or other um, funding mechanisms, uh, because they're doing it across such a broad spectrum that they're, they've come to recognize that everybody's going to do it different, right? Sarah's going to do it different than Lisa, and Lisa's going to do it different than Paula, so there has to be flexibility built in anyways, um, and so it's okay to push that envelope a little bit and say, I've lost a partner or they can't participate in this way, but they can give me volunteers in this way, as long as we're meeting the, you know, so renegotiation, I think can be helpful if it fits. Yeah. And I've had this experience with the grant. I don't know if you've experienced it, but um, the grant was awarded and we had seven partners and all of a sudden, we get calls from lots of other agencies that say, hey, we want to be a part of this grant. What do we need to do? How can we help? And that becomes one, if your finances are limited in the grant, you're probably only going to be able to fund those people that you initially put in the grant. Um, but I was in one situation where there, there got to be tension between who was actually initially involved in the grant in the community and then as word got out other people wanting to be involved uh, for visibility or other reasons and so that's kind of a challenge sometimes too instead of uh, too little number of partners and having too many people that want to to get involved because they think the project is neat and they want to be a part of the help so sometimes you can work those folks in in some way and in the situation that that I was in, um, we had our core group of partners that made most of the main decisions, but we ended up with, I don't really want to call it an advisory group, but it was kind of a cheerleading section of partners that um, maybe helped or coordinated uh, with us because they wanted to be uh, a part of the project. So that was a nice thing to happen, but it, it did cause some problems <laughs> initially until we got it organized. The next question that we were working with was how to maintain quality and partner performance. And um, during, usually annually on a grant, you have to file a report uh, and they will tell you the kinds of data that they expect you to include in the report. And some of that may need to be collected by partners. So one of the things I think is really important is getting a real good understanding at the beginning of what information is needed by the grantor and whether that is currently being collected by the partner organizations as part of their um, data and monitoring process or not. And if it's not being collected, then you wanna create some kind of process so that they're collecting this data for you. Uh, it could be, um, monthly reporting where you send in a report about your activities. It could be uh, that they're asking for quantitative data like participation and count numbers. Um, so you want to make it as easy as possible for these organizations to send you the data you need for your reporting, um, but also have that conversation with them um, up front from the very beginning of the grant about what kinds of information they're going to need to collect for you. Um, Paula, do you have anything, thoughts about that? Yeah, the only thing that worked really well for me was also um, 
creating a template that was universal to some degree, because then I got the information in the way that I needed it. So it wasn't creating a bunch of work, additional work for me when it came time to submitting my either, I had quarterly reports, biannual, bigger report, and then a year end report every year. And so uh, what I realized was that, boy, that data can come in all different formats. And do I really, I mean, do I really want to redo work. And so I just set up some templates and uh, the template was a one size fits all, although all of them did not fill in all the information. Uh, but I tried to, at least when I wrote the grant, I really wanted to put some thought into what are the requirements for reporting and built that into the grant writing process and the dollars and the requirements so that we weren't going through wondering, first of all, what data and then how easy it was going to be co to collect. Um, so that was where my partners, I had to really talk to them about, do you already collect this data? And if you don't, what? how could we collect it? And then I set up some templates so that when I got it back, I was reading it and it was clear to me and I was getting exactly what I wanted and not something that they thought I wanted. Um, that, that was a lesson learned. I didn't have the template at first and then I was getting all this data and I could not it spent, I spent hours and hours dissecting it and that just wasn't gonna work. So I would suggest that if you're writing the grant, put some thought into and be very clear about not only the kind of data, but how you're gonna collect it because that adds time and money and effort. And then once you understand that, make sure that your partners know when they're signing on that they're gonna to have to produce that and then give them as many tools to make it as easy for them to do that for you um, so that they just get in the habit right from the beginning. Um, Cause I know sometimes grants get started and then about five minutes before the report is due, you're like, oh no, I need this data, oh no, where is it? How am I going to get it? And then everybody's rushing around. So yeah. I tried to give them as much um, notice. And I built that into my schedule of deliverables also. So at the two month mark or two weeks before my report was due, their reports were due. And then I could build the report and be ready to send it off. So it was on time. So um, yeah, anything we can do to make sure we're getting that as we go and not trying to gather it midnight the night before the reports due is probably going to save you lots of time and effort. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually um, had grantors starting to ask for testimonial kinds of data. I, I mean, typically I would think it would be account data or financial data that they're interested in, but more and more I'm seeing, um, yeah, send us the, the video clip of your children's workshop or uh, get testimonials of people who received your services and how it was valuable to them. Um, so some of the kinds of data that you might explore to collect might actually be something kind of unusual, uh, photographs or other kinds of data. So uh, you want to get that kind of all cleared up at the beginning. Um, okay, um, look at number six, what to do if you need to make strategic changes in the work of the grant. Um, you're going to have to be innovative uh, and come up with some solutions sometimes to problems that maybe blindside you that you would never have thought were going to arise. Um, but uh, you want to be sure that whatever happens, the, the actual work of the grant gets done. Um, so being prepared to negotiate with your partners and call your program officer, all those things are, are really critical um, when you come up to a challenge. Um, I'm thinking of a grant that I worked on and um, the grant was awarded under one executive director. We left, we had a long search process and the grant kind of went on hold. Um, then we got another executive director. That person didn't last very long and we started all over again. And we essentially lost almost a year of the grant. And I had to call the program officer and say, what do we do? You know, we're, this is a small organization of five people and they've lost their executive director twice now. And, and we finally have got someone in place, but there is no way we're gonna meet our deadline in another year because we've lost this entire year trying to replace this key person. Um, and they said, well, we can give you an extension of a year. 
and nothing in their paperwork said anything about extensions. But when we went to the program officer and shared our challenge here, they allowed us an extension and we were able to complete the grant successfully. So um, you, you really don't want to not be in compliance with the grant and not meet your deadlines. And so when things happen that are gonna be barriers to that, reach out to that program officer and just be frank. You know, we're, we're a five person organization and we don't have an executive director right now. We're struggling and they have been very helpful. I found federal grant folks to be just really helpful. Yeah. So don't be afraid even for a federal grant to call that program officer. Paula, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I was going to say the other challenge that I had along the way is sometimes related to the budget line items, yeah. right? So when you set up that original grant budget and then you say, we're going to spend a million dollars on this and you really don't need to, but you need to spend some money someplace else. And so there was a lot of budget adjustments that happened over the course of the grant, because when we went into it, we thought this is how it was gonna happen. And then as we started working, we realized, mm, maybe not so much. And so I, um, they also allowed for budget adjustments, right? I think, that, I mean, the program manager, my program manager said, we really just care about you staying within the confines of the overall budget, not necessarily how each line item is being spent. And so I went back a lot of times with budget adjustments and with the justification for whatever the reason was almost always got approved. So I would say too, don't be afraid to ask for uh, budget line item changes. They're not going to give you more money and you definitely want to spend the money you do get. But within that, how do you shift them among different lines uh, that make sense? Um, I never tried to add staff, but I think as far as effort, what I realized was maybe I needed to do a little bit more marketing material to get people to come to do something. And so I shifted money there. Um, and so we caught, I, and I just said, and she said that was fine, right? So as long as I had justification. So in addition to time extensions, you might also want to talk to them about how do we align the budget differently as we go along because these are the lessons we learn and depending on the length of the time of the grant you're going to have a lot of lessons learned where you're going to need some flexibility and um i think that that is also helpful because at first when i got my grant it was like i can't ask them anything i've just got to do exactly what i said i was going to do and that is was so far from the truth. Um, and, and we realized that every, they realized that everybody was doing something different. Um, and so uh, they were more flexible. So I, I say, don't be afraid to ask. The worst they can say is no, and you're no worse off. And if they say yes, you're better off. So yes. Um, the last question that we were going to uh, address today was what are some strategies to ensure accurate, accurate documentation to meet all the grant deadlines and reporting requirements. And we have mentioned those under some of the other topics, but uh, I wanna go back again to the assurances. When you get a grant, you will get, it almost looks like a legal document. But there will be lots of forms to go through and things to sign, and that's a contract. And it may be everything from you have to put the funder's logo on everything you print and all the websites you have. It could be something along those lines. Uh, it will talk about all the specific things that they expect you to do. For example, if you're gonna buy something, you have to have three bids, submit it to the grant funder, they approve it and you can then choose the one that you want. So, um, those assurances will specify everything. And you're gonna go back and look at those periodically because you're gonna run into situations where um, you just think, oh, I'm proceeding with this, but then you find out that the assurances have some requirement for you. So those are real important. And I think it's really helpful to have a meeting uh, with all of your partners and to go through the assurances with them. So they understand that this, this is what the grant is and here's your piece of it and why that's important and why we need you to collect that data. And, you know, put the logo funded by on everything that comes out under this grant. Um, so I think that's an important point. Uh, we've already mentioned about 
identifying the data and coming up with some kind of format and timeline of how frequently the data is to be submitted and to who, to whom. Um, and then Paula mentioned a calendar uh, to help you identify when the report is due. So having some kind of shared document process uh, where people can see that timeline and where those deadlines are uh, is really helpful. <clears throat> Sending out notices to folks in advance, hey, your data is due in a week, don't forget. Hey, your data is due tomorrow, don't forget. Then they'll forget, hey, your data was due yesterday. <laughs> but, uh, so you will have to do some tracking down of, of uh, data because it's that's just how it is. Everybody's very busy and oftentimes grants are not necessarily the partner's core work. It's something that, that they're find important and they want to be a part of, but it might not be their main focus. So making sure that they, you know, get plenty of opportunities to submit the data in a timely fashion is, is a challenge. Um, also keeping it simple, <laughs> uh, this, the more complicated it gets, the harder it gets. So trying to simplify and streamline processes for your partners is really important in keeping them engaged. Anything you wanna add, Paula? I would just say too, uh, a lot of times the way in which we partner is either direct funds or volunteer hours. Uh -huh. And the volunteer hours are a little tricky. So we, we definitely need to keep good documentation on those volunteer hours. So if they said, we're gonna donate 20 hours a month, make sure you're documenting how they're donating that time because that goes into your, basically your, I mean, it's, it might as well be money, right? And so um, it's easier sometimes to say, oh, we spent the money on this. It's much harder after the fact to decide how many volunteer hours, what was their match? How did they work? So, you know, for instance, the volunteer match, uh, could be maybe they do your financial reports, right? The volunteer match could be maybe they're going to teach. Their volunteer match could be we're going to plan an event and, and have it, you know, whatever it looks like. So we mean we you also need to make sure you're documenting not only how you're spending the money, but how you're spending the time. And and anytime you have volunteer hours, it, they almost always want a sign-in sheet. Who's volunteering? How often they volunteer? And boy, that was one of those little things buried in deep in the assurance that I missed. And so we had done some things and the partner said, oh, I fulfilled my hours. And I said, oh, how'd you fulfill your hours? And we had to go back and try to backtrack. So those assurances were, they sat in on a notebook on my desk every day. Like every time I did something, what is it I'm supposed to be tracking and how am I supposed to get it? So don't forget about the volunteer hours as well as the budget, as well as the tasks, you know, check marks, you know. And in lots of grants, any volunteer hours, they need to sign in, actually sign in uh, or send you an email. And in one grant I worked with, they would come in and a staff person would sign them in. And that was considered, uh, they didn't count those hours because they said, we need the volunteer signature. Uh, so when you're working with volunteer hours, uh, we can't emphasize documentation enough and, and get it from the volunteer themselves, not, not a staff person filling their name in on the sign-in sheet. Uh, they need to sign in or they need to send an email from their email address that says they worked so many hours uh, so that you can track it. And if you are using some staff time, um, either the grant is paying for some staff time or the they're uh, using that staff time as match, like you might be using 15% of the executive director's time for match, um, that needs to be noted on the payroll or on the hours worked. So if someone is paid 50% by the grant, then you need to have on their payroll in your uh, budget line item number that, that that is grant funded. So that if you get audited, you can show that yes, in fact, we did charge 50% of their salary to the grant. Yeah, um, and I had to and I had to also specify specifically what they were doing for that 15%. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, so you can't just say, I'm gonna pay somebody 10% of their time. 
okay, great, but what are they going to do 10% of the time related to this grant specifically? And yeah. so even as staff come and go, you might have to renegotiate that those roles and shift them. And that's another area that I shifted. We lost a staff person who was assigned. I had to either, I had to hire somebody new because they were 100% or 50%. And I found that the the um, grant required me to send their resume and send their experience and sort of give me an approval that I could utilize them to serve uh, in those functions. So yeah, people and how you pay them is really critical, especially if the grant allows you to hire staff. And, and then um, the other interesting kind of thing was, you know, we bought uh, the grant allowed us to buy a computer, right, for that person to work on or whatever it was. And then my question was, is what do we do with all this stuff when the grant's over? Is there an expectation that you guys are going to take this stuff or what do we do with it? And so that equipment in person, you know, kind of dissolving the grant became sometimes a little bit interesting too. Um, we just didn't like, okay, the three years is up and everything's closed out. We find out, right, you know, we did our final report. We had built assets, so to speak. And so I had to get dispensation and reports and approval from my program manager related to, okay, what do I do with these computers we bought or this, whatever it is, whatever the tangible yeah. assets were. So that was another thing that wasn't exactly spelled out uh, in the grant assurances and that we had to sort of make up as we went along. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, that concludes what we were going to discuss today. Uh, are there any questions anybody has? Well, we will be recording this session and uh, getting it posted on the website as a resource for anyone who needs it. Uh, once again, I want to thank you, Paula, for helping out with this workshop. And I hope. Uh, Wish everybody a successful time with their grants. Thanks Lisa, for Lisa, may I jump in? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa and Paula, wow, what a treasure chest of expertise between you two. Thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. I was just wondering, not now, even though I know you could, but I might, I wonder if we might do one of these about how to prepare or how to think about how to reach out to others to partner on mm. collaborations. Yeah. I find, you know, you want to pick up the phone, you know, it's kind of like you're a blind date or something. Hello, you want to do this? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just throwing that out to you and thank you. And just a couple of things to maybe mention or not, uh, you're the experts, uh, the publication, maybe reminding everybody that sometimes you don't announce the grant until you've reached a certain point and that everybody knows to needs to know what to say about a, a grant that's a collaborative and I guess the other thing is payment making sure everybody understands are they getting paid a, a certain amount every month or is it based on work yep. so those are just a couple of things I would throw in but this was excellent thank you so much and thank you for taping it because I know some people might have had a holiday, some not. So thank you for having yeah. us today and spending your holiday providing it. Sarah, that's a really good point that I thought I, you know, we did, I didn't mention a little bit, but you're right. There's there's some st strategy related to announcing the grant and that kickoff meeting, right? So I, I'm thinking about my area and the grant that I worked on. Uh, one sticking out in my mind was this was a big deal, right? And so if we want the momentum to continue, you know, we've decided that we had to make a big splash, but before we could make a big splash, the partners had to sort of like be prepared to show up. They had to be prepared to talk about why they wanted to be part of this. Cause that was critical, right? Why are, why are certain people stepping up and maybe some other people aren't? And, you know, um, Lisa's really great about reminding us every time we go for a grant, right? When you need, when you're going to write a grant, you should probably already have some relationships built with people in the community. So you're not like, okay, stranger. All right, Sarah Robinson, you don't know me, but I really need to put your name on this grant. What do you say? And it's like, well, I, I don't know. What do we, right. So Lisa has always said, make sure you're building these relationships with 
people in the community as a general practice. And that way, when it comes time for a grant, you can say, you know what, I'm calling Sarah because she kind of has some interest in this and she kind of does this and I don't want to call her blind. And so I think that that's really good about building some of those key relationships ahead of time. And second of all, build, expanding your network enough to know that they can call on you just like you can call on them because Sometimes they're looking at things that you would never in a million years have the capacity to go after, but you could play a small role in. And so um, when you think about announcing things um, and bringing partners along, letting them have some limelight too, and why that's so important for them to be there. And then of course, once, and then of course, I love it because then it's peer pressure, right? So once it's out there, then it's like, oh yeah, hey, Sarah said she was going to do this. Where's, where's Sarah at now, right? So there's some peer pressure. So it works kind of both ways. Um, and so I appreciate you saying that because it is the marketing and the kickoff meeting and the words that you use and the context and the big picture is all going to help you keep your momentum um, and want to engage partners. And sometimes, like Lisa said, that's how you get other people involved. And I don't think there's ever been a time where my program manager said, oh, no, you can't have 50 partners. <laughs> of course you can have 50 partners, right? Um, you can just, and that might be a way to... Um, keep work going because sometimes we struggle with like, okay, now we've been through the grant process and the grant's over, now what? You'll need those partners if you wanna sustain it past that original funding. And so that's why these partners are so critical is that I didn't want them just for the three years. I wanted them for six and 10 years. I wanted whatever we started to continue. And sometimes they're the way, they're the way that we can continue. And so I think about, I want to encourage anybody who's doing a grant, don't just think about the short term, whatever the time frame and the money you have, but really the long term is like, because you hate to start something in the community or in your organization, and then it has to end because the funding's gone. So that whole time, you're not only spending the money and working the grant, you're also thinking, how are we going to sustain this? And it's a two, it's two prong and you need those partners to do that. Oh, you're so right. And, and I also think of some of the smaller agencies that are invited in, this really gives them an opportunity to show the community their work and their values. So Absolutely. great opportunity. Absolutely. I'll throw in one thing and you all might say, oh, that's, you know, that's so old because I'm old. But my ancient history was when we were collaborating and I always had to pass things through my board and I'm, you know, might have not be the same this day and age, but okay, we're collaborating now. How much are we getting out of this? And are we really covering our costs here? Yeah. Yeah. So again, I don't know if boards are thinking that way or not, but I'll leave it to you two to <laughs> discuss or discuss. I think there's always that return on investment, right? Because time is money. It's that return on investment. And, you know, you, you have to think about that because, Gosh, if you're if you're over capacity, I mean, and you've got so much stuff going on and you are short of staff, especially in this day and age, you really do have to think strategically about does this um, advance our mission and our purpose? Is it the right thing to do? Is it something because we are a strong community partner we should, we're, we're going to be involved in? And uh, somebody always says, you know, we have to think about inviting the unusual suspects, people who maybe we don't normally go to, but probably have a vested interest, right, to involve. But yeah, it's about the return on investment. And like you said, a lot of the nonprofit boards and other, they have boards that they're responding to. And so if it's something that the executive director really thinks is a good idea. And even if they don't, I think you have to take the ask to them because they may hear from somebody else. Oh yeah, we went to Sarah and she said no. And then Sarah gets called into the board and says, what, what? We should be involved in this. Um, so yeah. Kind of digressing back to one of your earlier questions, Sarah, about uh, cold calling people. Yes, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> um, usually I, if there's an organization, especially if it's a state organization or something that I don't know particularly well, I've uh, written an inquiry email and attached the grant to it and said, we're looking for partners. We think that you might be interested in doing this piece of it or helping us with this piece of it. You know, could I make an appointment to, to visit with you next week or something along that line. So I send them the grant proposal and say, hey, we want to do this. 
we'd love to have you uh, consider it. And, and, you know, once you get to know that organization a little better, you may say, oh, this is a good fit, or, you know, maybe these folks, it really isn't a part of their mission, and we need to keep moving on. So there are some ones that are logical sometimes in grants there's there's real logical partners for you to get then sometimes there might be some partners that uh, might not be uh, ones that you would immediately think of that might be politically helpful like a support letter from the mayor or uh, the city is behind this or um, that they may really, really might be not performing any tasks with the grant but are simply there to provide support uh, and, and expertise uh, about something. So uh, that getting partners takes a lot of time um, and most grants want you to do that. Um, and I also would like to point out that the more partners you have, the more administrative time it takes for you to have to, you know, keep everybody going down the same path, uh, especially if it's for two or three years. So um, I, I think partners are essential and they're very valuable, but um, again, going back to that word strategic, they need to be strategic partners. Oh, thank you both. Gr great ideas and thoughts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for being here today and helping us along. There were really good questions that we hadn't thought about. <laughs> so uh, I hope that everyone finds this helpful uh, on the recording and I appreciate the Public Policy and Management Center for um, the Recovery Connect grant. So have a good rest of the day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.